Yesterday, I was walking back home after hanging out with some friends. I was sober and in my right mind. I've never been afraid to walk alone in the dark. I'm quite tall and intimidating looking from a distance, and I always bring a pocket knife when I know I'll be walking in the dark. Anyway, I was walking past some woods on the way back to my house when I heard my mother's voice calling for me. Gabriel, help. This was coming from inside the woods. I immediately recognized her voice and turned to look into the woods. She kept calling my name over and over. I couldn't see anything. It was far too dark to see through the trees. Mom, I called back heading towards the woods. She sounded like she was in trouble and scared. I assumed that she'd gone for a run like she did every night, and somehow got lost in the woods. Then I realized it couldn't be her. She texted me only 10 minutes before asking me to come home soon to watch my little sister, so she could go on a run. I stopped dead in my tracks and called my mum. The voice in the woods is still calling my name, and getting more frantic by the second. She picked up, and I immediately asked her if she was in the woods. She said no. She was back home with my little sister. I swear to God, as soon as she said that, her voice stopped calling my name from inside the woods. I was overcome with a wave of dread and fear that I'd never felt before. Something in the woods was trying to lure me in using my mother's voice, and it knew my full name. Not just my nickname which made things even scarier because the only person who calls me Gabriel is my mum. I immediately turned and ran faster than I ever had run before back home. When I got back, my legs felt like jelly and my lungs burned. I opened the door and there she was, my mother, sitting on the couch with my sister. I would think this was some sort of prank, but my mum isn't one for pranks. And even if she was, there's no way she could have gotten home before me without me seeing her. My only question is, what was in those woods? I'm a female in my late 20s, 5'8", 135 pounds, who would be described by her friends as very adventurous, immodest, uninhibited to all, too eager to press the boundaries of her experience and just a tad crazy. The foundation for my adventures was laid some time ago while watching television with my friends, Todd and Beth. We were watching the Survivor TV series, and I piped up and said that they should be totally alone and deprived of clothing. So my friend said, oh, like you could do that. And so the challenge was served and I accepted. As the scenario developed, I was to be abandoned on their private ranch, deprived of any clothing, including shoes, left to wander some 2,500 acres to locate food and drink in hidden ice chests until such time as to I was to be picked up at the far end of the property some three miles away. I was provided a mattress to sleep on, placed out in the middle of a huge open pasture with no blankets or pillow. The chests were scattered and I had to return to the mattress at night to sleep on. Basically, I couldn't sit in one place and wait to be collected. The dangers were poisonous snakes, insects, and some predators, mountain lions and coyotes, and the elements. I spent considerable time conditioning my feet as I felt that they would be my most vulnerable attribute. So when the day came, we drove 30 miles out to their ranch and gave me a map to locate the chests took all my clothing and dumped me in the middle of nowhere for three days and two nights. At the end of the weekend, I was picked up, filthy, sunburnt, and tired, but I felt victorious. The experience sparked in me the desire to periodically repeat the thrill of the state of vulnerability and adventure. Several times a year, I repeat it, although I do find myself without my friend's participation. I do always coordinate with them when I'm going and to take a cell phone with me. I take minimal provisions, park my car, lock my clothing in it, hide the keys nearby so I don't lose them, and then hike, etc. 
explore the camp in the rugged wastelands of Texas. My camp is merely a spot where I keep a tent to hide in should it rain. I carry it in a sleeping bag that I stuff with an air mattress. I don't sleep inside it, I just lay on top of it out in the open. My last adventure started like the others, lock clothes in the car, hide keys and hike to my camp. Upon arrival, I noticed that the sun and elements had taken a toll on my cheap one person tent, but it looked like it might protect against mild rain, although none was forecast. I put my sleeping pad in it so it wouldn't blow away. And also my bag of snacks, cell phone water, and a flask of bourbon. Then I went on my naturalist hike. I explored for several hours enjoying the wind and sun on my body and feeling part of nature. Towards sunset, I hiked back to camp, pulled the sleeping pad out of the tent, sat on it and ate. I sipped on my bourbon as I watched a beautiful sunset, then laid back on my pad and watched the clouds drift across the night sky until I drifted off to sleep. As I slept, more clouds moved in and the wind increased. The cooling breeze brought a chill and soon I felt the first raindrop plop on my belly. I pulled the bag into the tent and laid on it as I listened to the pitter patter on the nylon. As the wind and rain increased, I began to hear the thrashing of brush around me. Was the wind that strong? Then I heard the snapping of limbs and what sounded like growls. Not just growls though, snarls. Then a scream rang out. Something began tearing and pulling at the tent. It started pulling the tent over and dragging it off with me inside. At this point, my survival instincts kicked in and I bailed out of the tent and started running towards my car. I ran through the drenching rain and cold winds. In the dark and through the brush, scratching my body, I ran. I kept hearing the snarling and growling, but it seemed to be fading. Finally, I arrived at my car, found the keys, dropped them fumbling in the dark. And after I finally found them again in the mud, unlocked my car and started it and put on the lights. I didn't see anything between the swipes of the wipers. I drove out as fast as I could, got to the front gate and realized I had to get out to open it again. I took a careful look around and quickly ran through the rain, flung the gates open back in my car and began to drive. Soaking wet and muddy, I used my t-shirt laying on the seat to sop up the rain from my hair and face. It was then I noticed I had a rather deep scratch on my right breast that was bleeding quite a bit. I tried to wipe it with my t-shirt, but it didn't help. I drove the 30 miles home wondering if I'd get pulled over on the highway patrol for being out so late and how I would explain my situation. I got home at 4am. I had just left the soggy t-shirt and shorts in the car. I went to my house, took a shower, and felt the painful sting of the hot water on all the scratches of my body and my bruised feet. I toweled off and held a wash rag firmly against my right breast on the one particular deep scratch that continued to bleed. I sprawled out on my bed under the ceiling fan trying to sleep. Sleep never really came. So I got up around 9am and realized I left my cell phone in my bag and I'd left the gate open. Not a good thing. I threw on a pair of loose fitting terry cloth shorts, a baggy cut off t shirt that more than irritated my scratched up skin, and some shoes and drove over to my friend's house. My car was a mess inside and the t shirt and shorts I'd left in it were soaked. Upon arrival, I explained what happened and asked if they'd go with me to close the gate and retrieve my things. Their first reaction was Oh my, look at you, referring to the scratches up my legs, arms and belly. I lifted my t-shirt and showed them the numerous scratches on my breasts. I was a mess. We loaded up in their pickup and drove out to the ranch. The gate was still wide open. So when we drove in, Beth and I got out and closed it behind us. We parked where I parked my car and got out and started the trek up to camp. Upon arrival, we found the remains of the shoddy tent totally ripped up, the sleeping bag some 50 feet away from where I set it up. Among the debris I found my bag, cell phone was dirty but worked, 
and my flask was beside it. I opened it and finished it off in one big gulp. We searched but found no footprints that might reveal what attacked me. Todd said he would place game cameras in the area to see if he could record anything, but nothing ever showed up. I have mixed feelings about going back. I miss the experience and may spend time out there again, but only on day trips for now. Around 10 years ago, I had gone on a short hike in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont, around the base of Mount Glastonbury. It was just a short day hike and I planned to find the old railroad bed and check out the remains of the old ghost town there from the 19th century. I had gone before with a group of people and it was a beautiful hike with water and culminates with a great view of the area from an old fire tower. Thankfully, I wasn't completely alone and had brought my dog Bibi, a three year old Wattrider. She was good company for a trip like this and I was glad to have her along. I parked on an old logging road and found the path to the trail that would take me to the abandoned railroad bed that is now buried deep in the woods. I was a mile or two in and almost to the railroad bed when I heard something. It was whistling, the kind someone would use to call a dog. Instantly, Bibi looked up and tried to bolt to the right of the trail where the sound was coming from. Luckily, I had a good hold of her leash and stopped her from running off. She barked in the direction of the whistling, but I got her to sit and the whistling stopped. I had a strange feeling, even though I could not see who was whistling. It felt like it was directed towards Bibi and someone had tried to separate me from her. I was not sure what to do, but after a minute or two of no more sounds, I dismissed it as a coincidence and continued on our walk. Not 10 steps later, I heard a woman's voice from the other side of the trail. Hello, come here. We're just off the trail. And then I heard what sounded like the playful laughter of another woman. The tone of the calls were playful, almost seductive. Hello, come down here. What's your name? I was curious and even a little intrigued to check it out. The voice was very pleasant, but after a split second, I stopped myself from moving. Looking to the left where the voices were coming from, I could almost see a path through the trees, down the ridge, a perfectly straight line. There was no noise, not even the rustling of leaves or chirping of birds. I started to feel lightheaded and confused. Bibi barked again, and I snapped out of it. A feeling of complete dread overtook me. I reached into my pocket and pulled the Ruger LC9 I had in my pocket holster out and had the pistol to my side and clicked the safety off. As soon as I did that, I began to hear things again. Leaves rustling, birds tweeting. Looking to the left again, the path that had just been there was gone. After that, I decided to end my hike and we booked it back to the car without incident. The strangest thing was yet to come. When I got back to my car and drove off the mountain and had cell phone service again, my phone had been blown up with missed messages from my girlfriend and brother asking me where I was and why I wasn't back yet. I checked the time on my phone it was 4pm. I had started my hike around 8am. I'd been gone for eight hours and could only account for a couple of hours of the time. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened. I don't hike either and took up golf instead. There's a locally famous haunted road in my town called Upsom Road. However, it is more commonly known as Green Lady Cemetery Road. You can look it up online. There have been tons of reports of incidents on this road. It's a hot spot. If you grew up in my town, you've been down Green Lady Cemetery Road. I could go on for days about telling you the stories I've heard from others about this location, but I would rather tell you about the two experiences I've had on this road. 
The second one made me swear to never go down it, day or night, again. The road had never been paved. They've left it terribly bumpy and as a dirt road to stop people from going down it. Most times of the year, the town puts up barriers so no one drives through it. Not because it's a walking path, because simply they don't want people going down there. At one end of the road, there is an old piece of property that the town bought, that you'll often see a police car sitting in. If you decide to pull onto the road, you'll be pulled over immediately and be told you're trespassing, even though it is in fact public property. They can't legally stop you from driving down there, but most people don't know that and will turn you around. The road starts off as just a wooded dirt road. It's only about a mile long, and you can drastically see a change of scenery in a very short amount of time. As you pass the wooded area, you come up to a section of road where on your right is a small swamp, and on your left is more forest. However, nothing seems to be able to live out there. When you hit this section of road, you're officially in the hot spot. If you park your car and look around, you'll notice that trees don't seem to grow there. They are all dead and rotten. You will not hear birds chirping. It's dead silent. Going just slightly further up the road, just past the swamp, is where things get very eerie. On the left hand side of the road is a very, very old cemetery, where the Green Lady stays. The headstones are all dated from the 17 to 1800s. There's also a small foundation next to the cemetery, where a house used to stand. It's been reported time and time again, that people have witnessed a green mist floating around the cemetery. People have seen this green mist form into the shape of a woman in a dress, walk back and forth around the cemetery. And there are a few theories as to who this woman is, but I'm not completely sure anyone knows exactly who she was. Anyway, it's a bit of a rite of passage here in town where every kid who gets their license drives down the road at night, just one time to be able to say they've done it. Here are my two stories about it. When I purchased my first car, the first thing my friend Jordan and I did was take a drive down that road. I'd picked him up at his house at around 1030 at night, and we drove over there. It had been extremely hot that day, and towards the night, it had rained a bit and cooled down a bunch. That combined with the swamp being on the road, it was so foggy you couldn't see more than three feet in front of you. It was absolutely the worst time to be driving down there, to be honest. We'd both been a bit nervous and the fog wasn't helping us at all. We had been creeping down the road slowly, so we couldn't really see where we were going. We had gotten about 200 feet from the cemetery, when a teenager comes running out of the fog and runs right past our car. We didn't recognize him, but this kid was bolting down the road. He was dressed in a grey Nike t-shirt and black baseball shorts. He looked like he was about our age, so we were even more confused that we didn't recognise him. Jordan and I both agreed that the kid looked like he was running away from something, so we decided to turn around to offer him a ride. Mind you, there is a ton of bears and other large carnivores here, so we thought perhaps something might be chasing him. I quickly turned the car around and started driving back in the direction the kid was running. We drove for a little bit but didn't see him. The fog had started to clear up a bit, so we were able to see a decent distance in front of us, but we still couldn't see him. He wasn't on the road. He wasn't in the forest. He was simply gone. I rolled down my window and started to yell, Hey man, are you okay? Do you need a ride? Hoping that the kid would pop out from behind a tree or something. But nothing. The kid was simply gone. Maybe he was some kid who decided to walk down that road at night and got spooked. Maybe he saw headlights and thought we were cops and hid from us. We still don't know to this day. We had asked around in school the next day if anyone knew of anyone who went for a walk down that road at night, but we never heard anything. If there was a kid out there that late and he ran up into the forest, that's even scarier than the thought of the ghost teen running past our car. 
I'll never forget the look on that kid's face as he ran past our car. He looked like he was scared, panicking, and I really wish I were able to find out who he was. Now for my second and final experience. Jordan, the same friend from the previous story, had gotten his first car. So obviously the first thing we had to do was go down the road. The weird thing about this drive is that once again, as we got closer to the cemetery, a thick layer of fog had started to pour out of the trees from the swamp. Although the weather had been the same all day with no rain and no temperature drops, nothing. Luckily, this fog wasn't as thick as before, and we could see in front of us. We'd gotten up to the cemetery and Jordan parked the car. We sat around for a little while and looked at the cemetery. The forest just observed everything. After five or so minutes, Jordan looks at me and says, Dude, how weird would it be if I looked in the rearview mirror and there was someone in the back seat? Who says that? I mean, honestly, dude, look where we are. It's not even a joke. That's seriously not funny, bro. I told him. He looked up in the mirror and screamed. I spun around, looked in the back seat, and there was nothing there. He started laughing. I got you, bro. Again, you're not funny, Jordan. He didn't want to keep wasting the gas, so he turned off the car and shut off the headlights. Now this idiot has us sitting on a famously haunted road in the middle of the night, in the pitch darkness, surrounded by forest. We're parked right in front of the old building foundation of the cemetery. It's just ahead of us. We sat there for a few minutes, smoking cigarettes and talking about nonsense. I'm kind of staring off into the trees at this point honestly a bit bored. When out of nowhere, Jordan says, Hey, there's someone in the forest. I shrug it off, assuming he's messing with me. When I see a subtle light in the forest behind the cemetery, it looked like a flashlight with batteries that were as close to dead as they could be. The light vanished after a few seconds. And we both sat there with our eyes glued to the patch of forest. Roughly 30 seconds later, a tall, ovular light started to appear in the same spot that the light came from. Jordan says to me, Okay, dude, I'm done. Let's go. And I'm telling him, No, hang on, wait. His hands are on the key. He's getting ready to start up the truck and drive away. The light was very faded, a little hard to see, but when the forest behind it is pitch black, it stood out. It slowly started to move along the rock wall at the back side of the cemetery, and Jordan started up the truck. He was so ready to leave. As his headlights kicked on, we saw a green mist floating around the road. Jordan yells out, screw this, and slams the truck in reverse and backs up until he felt far enough away to turn around. We had always heard reports of the green mist. Supposedly, if you wait long enough, you'll see the green lady walk around in the mist. But we were too scared to wait for that to happen. I never thought the green mist was real until that night. And to this day, I swear I will never drive down that road ever again. I highly recommend you look it up. It's probably one of Connecticut's most famous paranormal hotspots. My mother grew up in Paraguay. It's a small third world country. The area where my mum grew up is especially rural in the countryside, where most of the people were poor. Her house was across from very thick woods that stretched out for miles. One afternoon before it got dark, my grandmother and mother were outside. My mum was about seven at the time when she spotted what she described as a beautiful little white baby chick. She always loved animals and enjoyed catching them. So she wanted to catch it. It kept running away from her even though it seemed like she was just about to catch it multiple times. After a while, it seemed like she was running in circles. My grandma came out of nowhere and yanked my mum's hair. My mum said at that moment, she was broken from a trance that the sun had already set. And she was actually very deep in the woods. My grandma really tried to explain to her that El Bombero almost succeeded in taking her. My mum tried to explain to my grandma about the pretty little chick, but of course it was nowhere to be found. My grandma said my mum seemed to be playing normally, 
and then all of a sudden just started walking fast towards the woods. My grandma thankfully ran after her and was able to catch her. I always think what would have happened had my grandma not been there to stop it. I'm glad she was. At the time of this story, the coronavirus quarantine was in effect in my area. After a good week of doing absolutely nothing productive, I was getting cabin fever and wanted to get some fresh air. So I opted to visit a state park in my area where I figured I wouldn't really come across anyone. It was a fairly beautiful day outside and the temperature was a little cold, but not enough to warrant a jacket. When I pulled up into the parking lot of Wells State Park, Sturbridge, MA, there were a lot of other people that seemed to have the same idea that I did. So I decided that I would take a trail that I wouldn't see many other people on. About 30 minutes into the walk, the forest seemed off. Despite the clear, pretty day, I couldn't help but feel this ominous energy around me. It was a feeling of being overwhelmed. The forest was incredibly alive. Birds were chirping back and forth boisterously, and I spotted hawks flying low at least seven times, as well as squirrels screaming back and forth at one another in very close proximity to me. Further into the trail, it kept pursuing and got increasingly louder before stopping in a few fading calls. At this point, I was able to record a video of it. I made the decision to get out of there when the noise stopped and take the trail to Carpenter's Rock, a popular cliff close to the exit of the park. At this point, it was silent. I couldn't hear anything but my steps and a few planes flying overhead. And suddenly almost everything screamed. It was like a short burst of animal calls of all kinds. And it was loud and simultaneous, like everything in a good mile around me got stabbed in the gut. I hightailed it away. And after 15 minutes, I ended up back at the parking lot and spoke with a couple of hikers about it. At least five other people heard it and booked it like I did. If there are any rangers or biologists who know what this could be, please let me know. I was about 19. My best friend had become friends with a guy called Chris. Chris lived with his mom, Crystal, in a small house located in a village in Cumberland. Crystal was really cool and would let us hang out there. The house was built in the 50s or 60s. All the doors in the house were glass. The living room had two entrances with double doors. And there was a conservatory on the back of the house, which the other doors led to. Basically at night, no matter where you stood, you could see everywhere on the ground floor, either directly or reflected in the conservatory. There was a small garden with a fence. And then the woods. The people in the village itself were weird. We would have a nervous laugh about it being like the children of the corn, village of the damned, or the League of Gentlemen. The kids in the street would stop and stare as we walked by. Shopkeepers would stop what they were doing and smile but never say a word the whole time. People walking down the street would either be mumbling or laughing to themselves. On a few occasions, they would walk until just past us, scream and then run off down the street, as we all stood looking bewildered at each other. And I would say, I hope you know we're all gonna pass here. I'm not exaggerating when I say, that is how everyone was on the street. They behaved in that way without fail. It was creepy, absurd, and a little bit hilarious. One day, me and my friend Bud went to the local pub, where everyone stopped and turned to look at us. The pub was full of men in polo shirts. Anyway, you just need to understand the nature, the surrealism of this place, where everything was quite strange. It wasn't long into my first visit before we got Crystal talking about some of the weird things that go on, not just in the house, but the whole area. 
she had collected newspaper clippings from the local paper to back up some of her stories. Here are some events that I remember she told me. If you've ever heard of the Bonnie Bridge UFO sightings, on one of these occasions, a UFO was spotted near the village. The woods were well known in the area for the amount of bodies that turned up. It was rumoured that a coven of witches practised black magic in the woods. People said they had seen robed groups of people in the woods and white horses in nearby fields. People had been found with their lives taken where the trails cut off. Chris and Crystal told me one night the entire street was out in the backyard. There was chanting coming from the woods. They said it was so loud it must have been at least 50 people. Men, women, deep voices, high voices. Crystal said the creepiest part was as soon as the chanting stopped, it would instantly start in another part of the forest, like they were jumping from one part to another or a group of hundreds of people throughout the forest were performing some perfectly coordinated chanting in the dark. To a bunch of teenage adventurers, this place was crazy. Crystal also mentioned that strange objects had been left on the steps in the backyard, feathers and twigs tied with twine, and a few times robed figures standing just beyond the fence. Well, that was all mind blowing. And then she started to tell us about the house, both Crystal and Chris refused to use the second floor bathroom to go in to the spare bedroom. At some point, Crystal had noticed scrabbling sounds coming from the loft. She assumed it was either a rat or a squirrel that had gotten in. Also that all the spoons in the house had started to go missing. Each time she returned to the house, another spoon was gone. Finally, there were no spoons left and she tore the house apart trying to find just one with no luck. She searched everywhere except the spare bedroom. She was pumping herself, getting ready to go in, when she heard a bump from the loft. Oh no, she thought, there's someone living in the loft. She called the police, Chris had come home from a friend's house at this point, and they both listened to the bumping and scrabbling as they waited for the police. Even the police heard it when they arrived, they pulled down the hatch, went in, and found nothing, except all the spoons laid in a row in front of a burned out candle. The policeman straight faced suggested she get an exorcist. They never told me why they didn't go into the other rooms, but Crystal believed she was cursed and that her ex-husband had something to do with it. Despite the honesty in their face and the clippings and all the things I'd experienced in my life, at that point, I was skeptical. It's hard to let go of that, even when we did start experiencing things. Often a group of us would be hanging out, watching a movie or something when this would happen. The first time we all sat there, gradually it dawned on me I could hear something, a perfectly natural sound. Someone was in the kitchen, clearing dishes away. I could see reflected in the conservatory window, someone moving back and forward in the kitchen. I looked left and right, doing a head count, and felt my blood drain. I turned to my buddy and said quietly, Who the hell's in the kitchen? Still looking at the TV, he said, Oh, it's a uh, quick head count. I don't know. The rest of the group had begun to catch on. They saw it too. We armed ourselves with anything we could find. Golf clubs, chairs, guitars. Half of us took the hallway entrance and the other conservatory entrance. As soon as someone could see directly into the kitchen, the noise straight up stopped, the clattering right up until the very last moment. None of us slept that night. However, it happened again and again. We purposefully took people who had never been there and knew nothing about it and waited for them to notice. And it was always the same without fail. Sometimes when we all decided to crash for the night, the only place left was the spare room. I went up, opened the door, and some big guy had beat me to it, right there all wrapped up in the quilt. I went back downstairs with a sigh. My buddy asked me what was up and I explain. He's adamant no one is in there, pointing out where everyone is sleeping. I agree, but I'm also adamant someone is there. We both go up, open the door, 
and the quilt is flat and hanging off the bed. The second time it happens, I was with my girlfriend. She never set foot in that room again, but it wasn't just us that saw that one either. One night, one of my pals was taking his sweet time in the toilet. I decided to use the one upstairs. I walked up the stairs. I was looking down slightly. The top step came into view. It was dark, but nothing like pitch black. And there on top of the steps were legs, a black suit trouser, and a pair of polished black shoes. I tried with all my might to look up, but I just couldn't do it. And I went back down the stairs. One night it was Chris's birthday. He had a big party, loads of people, and the house was packed, blaring music. And at about three in the morning, Chris takes me up to his room window. Listen, he says. I run downstairs, grab my mate. He shuts off the music and everyone can hear it. Screams. 50 odd teenagers standing in the backyard and hanging out of a window in pure silence. I swear to you, I will not exaggerate. These were the most blood curdling screams I've ever heard. It sounded like a woman or child, and it was coming from the forest. I tell myself it was probably a fox. But whatever was happening to that thing, I would not wish on anyone. It was crying in pain and it was loud. The sound would become higher pitched and pop, and then gurgling and then start all over again. Every single one of us stood there for about an hour. Girls started crying. Some of the guys were freaking out, and there was nothing else to do. We couldn't just keep partying with that going on. The sound was absolute suffering. Maybe you guys in the States have heard of things like that with big predators over there. But the biggest predators we have here are foxes. And there was no commotion or barking or shouting. Just the sound of this poor thing screaming and gurgling over and over like it was on a megaphone. In all my years of camping in Scotland, I've never heard anything like that. However, the woods were beautiful in the daytime. We would walk through them often. Every time without fail, when we went through the woods during the day, high above us, two crows would be flying in the sky, cawing and knocking each other. But there was some other strange stuff in there. There was an area with wooden joists that had been merged into a tree, like they had grown out of it. They had nails protruding over them and stained with viscous black liquid. Near there, where the branches from the trees separate, that were perfectly twisted together. Strange symbols carved into a tree. Once we found large piles of white hair at the base of these trees, a ring of a baby oak tree that had been cut down. The stump in the center seemed to be bloodstained. There was an area where many tall tree saplings had been bent over and secured to make arches tall enough for a man to walk through. We had the place mapped out well in our heads. We knew where to go from each landmark to find the others. The area was segmented by roads too, but at night, even if we followed the compass to a T, nothing was in the right place. Fair enough, it's dark, you can get turned around, but what really gives me the creeps is that at night, and only at night, about 15 feet northeast from the ring of the tree stumps was a huge U-shaped hedge about 15 feet high. The U-shaped hedge created a corridor about 30 feet long with a dead end. It was monolithic, but we could only ever find it at night. Chris had a small den that he built when he was a kid. We hung out there a few hours one day, just chatting and stuff and then went back. The next day we returned to the den and there was a perfect three foot wide black circle and scorched in the grass around the den. It was summer. The grass was tall, thick and dry. I don't know how someone managed to do that. I think our constant investigating was annoying someone. We took it as a warning, but we didn't stop. After that, we weren't going so much and in smaller groups, but I don't remember much else happening after that. This next story, is from one of Chris's other group of friends that I heard before going to his house. So Chris had another group of friends who refused to go back to the house. Me and my best buddy knew one of them well, Darren. He was a really happy go lucky, really funny and cared about people 
an honestly great guy. They had similar experiences as we did, except these two. Not sure what order they happened in, so I'll start with what happened to Darren. We had been told that Darren would not talk about this. He would not say a word about it, having heard the story. I get that. So me and my buddy sat there with Darren in a pub in Glasgow city center. I was a chance meeting, but since he'd had a few drinks, I thought it would be worth asking. I said, dude, Crystal's house, what happened? He stiffened up and I said, I heard you won't talk about it. Can you just confirm what we've heard, even if it's just with a nod? He nodded and confirmed the whole story that way. And I'll just tell you as I've been told it. He was sitting in the conservatory. It was a nice day, bright and sunny, and Darren was sitting alone. He had his headphones on listening to music when something caught his eye from his peripheral vision. He turned to look. Standing at the conservatory door was a woman draped in a black robe. She had long straight blonde hair. Her eyes were wide and she was staring right at him. She brought her hand up and started tapping the glass frantically with her fingernail all the time staring wide-eyed right at him. Darren freaked, got up from the couch, looked back, and the woman had moved back, but in the same position, still staring, but now just tapping at the air. He moved to the end of the couch, looked back, and she was further back, doing the same thing. He got to the kitchen door. She's back further, doing the same thing. He ran into the house, one last look back, and she's still on the other side of the fence, still staring still pointing. Darren didn't stop running. He ran upstairs into the bathroom, lifted the toilet seat and started smacking it on his head. His friends heard and pulled him away and calmed him down. After he confirmed the bit about the toilet, I asked him why. He said he just didn't know. One day they all decided to trek down into the woods. I think the group was about eight strong, if not seven. Maybe one stayed behind. Anyway, Adam waited about five minutes after the rest set off because he wanted to freak them out. Adam had army experience. He was tall, six foot five. I knew him pretty well. He was cocky, funny, and confident. He told Crystal what he was doing and set off. About two hours went by and the rest of the group came back. Crystal asked, where's Adam? You guys guess what happened next. They all went back in search of Adam. It was getting dark. They split up, but stayed in earshot of each other. As they tell it, they searched for hours in the night. They met the edge of the woods, very upset at this point, losing hope. One of them shouted, For God's sake, if you're there, make a noise. Do something. Right there and then, they hear a thump. They follow the sound, and only about five feet away, there he is, on the ground, leaning against a log, groggy. They grab him up, drag him back to the house all the way, and he's just slurring. Witches, they got me, they got me. He had blood and a wound directly on top of his head. Blood was covering his face. He was close to delirious, so what they managed to get out of him was this. He ran down after them. He used his army training to sneak up on them. He was watching them from behind a tree. Then wham, he's on the ground leaning against a log. Three women in white robes with blonde hair are staring in front of him. They tell him he shouldn't be there, and if he keeps coming, it will be dangerous. The next thing he knows, his friends are shouting, asking him to make a noise. He groggily grabs a branch and starts hitting the log he's leaning on. He swears he follows them quite far into the woods, and the fact they found him where they did makes no sense. I spoke to him a lot about this. He was the most willing to talk and strangely the least bothered about the whole thing. He was also the only one in that group who wanted to go back, but that seemed to be the last straw for the rest of them. This is one more thing I almost forgot that Chris told me about. Him and a mutual friend called Taron went into the woods one day. They went to the den. They said it was a nice day until they started to head back. They heard a whistling noise. It got louder and louder, and they walked and walked until they were sure they'd left the woods. Then they began to panic. They started to run. The whistling started coming from in front of them, 
and they changed direction and ran. Taryn said the woods became a blur. They ran another way, and no matter which way they ran, the whistling was in front of them. Eventually, on the point of exhaustion, they fell out of the woods onto the road that led home. Taryn said it was the scariest experience of his life. He felt like they would never escape, and said he kept trying to slow down and be calm. But he just knew they had to run. I live in the Blue Ridge Mountains, very close to Stone Mountain State Park. I'm an avid hiker, and I've hiked many miles in these mountains. There is a large number of granite boulders at the base of this mountain, some as big as a small cabin. They have always been fascinating to me. And when you enter the wooded area, where the boulders are, there is an eerie quiet, seemingly void of wildlife. This happened last year while hiking with my boyfriend and our dogs. We had seen a couple of the waterfalls that day, and were going to hike to the lower falls. There had been very heavy rain for a few days, and I knew this trail had several creek crossings. I decided I didn't want to get wet, and told my boyfriend to go on without me and that I would wait. The falls were only another half mile or so ahead. My boyfriend and the dogs go on the creek, and then disappear out of my line of sight. As soon as I couldn't see them anymore, I was suddenly aware of how quiet the woods were. There were no birds chirping, nor squirrels rustling leaves. I don't usually get spooked, but all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming sense of dread. I felt as if something was watching me, and I couldn't shake the feeling. I had an urge to run after my boyfriend and started the creek crossing when I saw him come dashing back towards me. He too had an overwhelming sense of dread, and didn't get ten minutes down the trail before he turned back and ran to me. He said he couldn't shake the feeling that something was going to attack me. And this was at 11am on a summer's day, so not very big cat or bear kind of time. The next incident was very scary because I was alone with our dog. We were hiking the same section of Stone Mountain, but a different trail called Wolf Rock. On the way up I had seen many trees that were scorched, but that could have been due to lightning. I started getting an ominous feeling, so started picking up the pace to head back. When I was about a mile from my car, I heard what can only be described as a supersonic boom. It shook the ground and rattled the trees. It spooked me and my dog so badly, we ran most of the way back to the car. Later I tried describing the sound to my boyfriend to no avail, since I've never heard anything like it. Not gunfire, not a plane, not a rock slide, which I've all heard before. But while reading another person's story, it sparked my memory. They described the sound like that of a giant sledgehammer hitting a tin wall. That's the best way I can describe the noise I heard. That metallic bang reverberating through the woods was very unsettling. I want to share a story about a time when I was 14, where I became lost in the woods in a pretty familiar area. I was hunting in the mountains, somewhere around Huntingdon. I don't remember exactly where it was, as it was 25 years ago. The cabin we used to go to was at the top of a mountain, only accessible by dirt road. After driving several miles up, you would come to the top of the mountain, and the road would circle around at the end back to where you started. So one way up, and one way down. The road itself was wide enough for one and a half cars, so you would have to pull over some to let an overcoming vehicle pass. I left the cabin by myself in the afternoon, and walked down the driveway. I turned left on the road and walked maybe half a mile, and then turned right into the woods and walked down the mountain, to a spot I hunted before. I was probably a quarter of a mile down the mountain, 
and I eventually reached my spot, which had a large number of boulders and deer paths weaving in and around them. I sat there for a while and saw nothing, and decided to head back up. Now the area I was in was steep, no doubt about that, so it would naturally take a lot longer to climb up than to walk down. I was hiking and hiking, and it seemed to be taking longer than usual, but I thought nothing of it. After half an hour, 45 minutes of walking however, I started to get nervous. It was getting dark and surely I would be coming up on the dirt road soon. The sun kept setting and I kept going and no road. It was dusk now and I thought there was no way I was down that far and it would take me this long. How the hell did I miss the road? No way I missed it. Literally, there's no possible way for me to miss it. It circles around the entire top of the mountain. And now it's dusk. And I decide that maybe I somehow did just walk over it. I head back down the mountain for another 15 to 30 minutes and there's nothing. At this point, I'm scared. How am I missing the road? I'm getting annoyed at myself, trying to rationalize my position, trying to slow down and think. So I head back up. I had a dull flashlight, and it was just enough amber colored light to let me see obstacles so that I wouldn't trip. After walking and hiking back up for some time, I sat down. I was alone with a poor pathetic excuse for a light, and had no idea where I was. And that's when I noticed it. The nothingness. Nothing was making noise. Nothing was moving. At that point, I decided to go back down the mountain, the entire way. There was a really small ravine I'd have to climb down and out, but I thought maybe it was the only way, to walk down out the mountain and hit civilization. I walked for maybe half an hour, and I came across the dirt road and was shocked. There was no way I missed the road. To this day, I cannot believe that I missed it. I guess it's possible. But it seems like, based on the amount of time walking, that I should have crossed it more than once. And if I did, again, I should have realized I was on a dirt road. I actually haven't thought about this in a long time. It's just one of those things in life that's a bit crazy. I was fortunate enough to grow up on a lovely little secluded piece of land in Canada. I had a large house which was backed by beautiful forests and woodland. I never wanted much in the way of entertainment, as myself and my brother Gabriel had plenty of games to play in the dense forest, which kept us busy for most of the day. I was homeschooled and spent a lot of my time in and around that forest and grew to love it and know it like the back of my hand. My family is not very spiritual. My dad was an atheist, my mother a very casual Catholic. I think I might have gone into church twice in my life. Despite this, dad didn't like us going deep into the forest. Mum, much the same. They said it had funny vibes, some gun instinct I guess. They didn't have a problem with me and Gabe going into the forest, as long as we were sensible, were together, and did not go in too deep. We had enough of a feel for what was too deep to never cause a problem by venturing too far and getting lost or anything. But we would often still push into the woods a bit to explore new areas. There were some nights where I would be woken up by blue flashes coming through my window as if someone taped cellophane over a flashlight and was sporadically turning it off and on from above the canopy deep in the woods. Other nights, if the wind carried just right, you could hear voices in the dead of night. Sometimes conversations, sometimes wailing or shouting. Other times, whispers. Sometimes all three. I could never really hear what was being said. The woods stretched out for kilometers and to my knowledge was uninhabited, where the lights and noises came from. On one particular occasion, the activity climaxed. I was about 14. Me and Gabe wandered further than we ever had. We reached a point, and it was like something snapped. It was hard to describe. 
It was like the feeling you get when you break something, and you know you're about to get caught. We turned back pretty quickly. I think something followed us out of the woods. A few hours later I was reading in the living room, which had a big glass sliding door that faced the backyard and trees. That is when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. A humanoid dude, probably six feet tall, was beckoning me from the tree line. He had wild untamed hair, sickly, hairless skin, and didn't appear clothed. He just kept on beckoning, with this awkward, stiff movement of his arm. There was something totally off about him. I screeched for my dad, and when I did, the guy walked behind the nearest tree and vanished out of sight. I explained to my dad what I saw and looked outside, but found nothing. He told me I probably imagined something from my book. I know I definitely did not. This happened to me while I was still in high school, and would have been somewhere between 2005 to 2006. To this day, the experience gives me chills, and I cannot explain it. I am interested to see if someone here has experienced something like it, or heard of it before. After church one Sunday night, my friend and I were taking my cousin back to his house before heading to a restaurant to meet some friends. My cousin at the time lived way back in the woods, some six to eight miles down a very secluded gravel road in the Ozarks of Missouri. It was in the fall, so all the trees were bare. It was a new moon and very dark. Anyway, my friend and I dropped my cousin off without a hitch and began making our way back out of the woods, back to the main country road that would take us back to town. About halfway down the gravel road, back to the country road, we came around a curve and started heading up a small hill that crested about 60 yards ahead of us. When we saw this hill, there looked to be a single deer standing on the crest in the middle of the road. Being that this is the middle of the country, this is not too uncommon, obviously, but I thought nothing of it and figured it would run off as we got closer. I remember very vividly that as we were about halfway of the distance between us and it, what I thought was a deer suddenly became very apparent that it was not a deer. Instead, it was a very solid but translucent ball of dense fog or mist about the size of a deer. It was not standing on the road, but hovered about a meter above it and was not moving. At the time, I thought I might be seeing a smudge on my windscreen, so I reached to wipe the window, but it was nothing and remained on the road. When we got close enough that my headlights illuminated this thing in full, it slowly rose up into the air until it was about 20 feet off the ground, paused for a second, and then shot very fast into the woods to the right. I stopped the car and both my friend and I sat there in silence for a few minutes. And then we continued back down the country road, where my friend who has never swore finally broke the silence. What the F was that? Where my friend who never swears finally broke the silence. What the flip was that? We still talk about this until this day. This experience was quite jarring, and I will not drive between that road again at night. Has anyone ever heard of anything akin to this? I'd love to know what it could have possibly been. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31 year old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not seeing at least one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips and feeling very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. 
They're not long trails, but are all interconnected. So it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people. Maybe a school group, at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day, mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I've been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on sight, so this path was the best. I made my way up to the first little hill and made my way down the path where it makes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any sign of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally I am comforted seeing someone else, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once I tried to be smart, listen to my gut and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger like shadows that did not help calm my imagination down at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders and rock formations right smack in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left. And these marks were wrong. It was like someone walked around these rocks dragging their feet behind them. Animal? Perhaps. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way I came, but that would have added another four kilometers to getting back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation as I made it to the other side of the rocks. I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket I saw earlier. The person moved as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For Blue Jacket Man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I did not like the thought of either option, as I did not know this person and didn't want to know them at this point. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling them all the details in case I suddenly went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path, and I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight, and saw the man standing there, staring at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in it immediately, locked the doors, and curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or the nearby road. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Mr. Blue Jacket came from. It took me a few minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trail ahead. There was the damn blue jacket on a signpost. I had just passed it to get to my car. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to hike there alone ever again. Perhaps it was all an innocent misunderstanding, but my gut says otherwise. This happened to me and my two friends when I was 14. When I was a young kid, I was very rebellious and also the only child. 
I lived with my mom and my stepdad. My mom worked long hours and so did my stepdad, who used to leave for work every day at 5am. My mom worked six to seven hours at her care home for the elderly. After school, me and my two best friends loved going to the park opposite my flat where we'd talk, run around, play truth or dare, you know, just girly things. One thing about this park was that it had a forest just at the end, which was rumored to be haunted. We didn't believe in such things yet, but they excited us. Once we got very close to it and saw a few things, such as a mattress, blanket, toilet paper and some food. To me, it looked like a homeless person may have found shelter there. So I didn't look into it too much. But the boys at school said that there were devil worshippers. Again, we found this to be absurd and continued going to the park. One day it was dark around 8pm and we were still there. We were playing around on the swings when suddenly I realized my phone was missing from my pocket. This was extremely weird as I'd always kept a good arm on my phone because my parents would be pissed if I ever lost it. I told my friends that it was gone and we began looking everywhere for this phone, around the playground where it had to be because we'd walked straight through the metal gate. It wasn't there. I panicked hard more and more and we began searching further away. We were now by the lake looking for my phone when Ali said, I found it. I looked to where she was pointing to and to my relief, I saw my phone and couldn't be more thrilled. But what happened next made me sick. Next to my phone was a heart and some kind of organ. It looked like an intestine. The heart had a hole through it, which I noticed right away and pointed out. We were shocked and confused and honestly scared. After my friend Ali took a video with her phone, we then went to walk my friend Jamie to the bus stop and go home when we noticed a bright light shining from the forest. Now, the right decision would be to keep going and turn back but we were 14 and a bit stupid. So decided to investigate as we wanted to get to the bottom of where the guts came from. All three of us walked towards it giggling and laughing thinking it was a joke until we got closer still. It was too close and we could see something in the darkness. It appeared to be a man, but could have been a woman. It was hard to say and they had a stick sticking out from the back. As soon as we saw it, we quickly began to run back into the main road as this was no longer funny. Whoever was towards us did not have good intentions. While we ran, my friend Ali fell over. I quickly grabbed her and pulled her up as we continued running. We successfully made it onto the same road. Once we did, we looked back to see the person retreating back into the forest. Fair to say we were shaken up. We never went back to that park again. I'm now 20 years old and still cannot understand what happened that night, or what could have happened. We had nightmares for a while after this event, and we never spoke of it again. This happened to me when I was 17, around the time when most of my friends were just getting their driver licenses. We all had that rush for cars back then, so it was quite common for us to skip school and go for a ride out of town. The city where I live is surrounded by forests and two mountains. So we basically had a lot of places to go and chill. One day my friend was very excited to show us a place that he found about online, which was reputed for being quite odd. We looked it up and apparently it had a certain reputation for being a paranormal site. Being the typical group of teens, we collectively agreed to check it out ASAP, including me who more or less believes in spiritual stuff. Going up the mountain, we were listening to the radio until we lost the station to static, which for obvious reasons is what the radios do when you go deep into the woods. This entire experience is happening during a summer night. So we were feeling pretty careless and as excited as a person can be. Having no music to listen to, we started talking and discussing our expectations for this place with most of us having no expectation at all. Our conversation was suddenly interrupted by the loud static coming from the radio 
that we turned off just a few minutes ago. We were all a bit startled, but still nothing out the ordinary. It happened again a few minutes later. We all looked at the radio and it was still off. We quickly dismissed it as something that radios do for some reason, and again didn't pay that much attention. The third time that it happened, the driver hit the brakes and stopped the car. He turned to us and yelled, Did you hear that? What was that? Claiming that he heard a voice this time. None of us heard anything but static. The driver said he had had enough and switched the engine off. So there was no way for anything including the radio to be working. We sat like that for a while in pitch darkness, for there were no city lights around us and the forest had covered all the light sources like stars and stuff. So you couldn't distinguish a night sky from the canopy. That's how dark it was. The light indicating the radio turned on as soon as the static came. And I could tell we were all feeling a bit anxious by then. Through the static came a female voice singing, and it was very silent. For a second it got louder and then fell silent again and then vanished. But even weirder, the static vanished too. Once we switched the car back on and turned on the headlights, we observed what seemed to be smudges of fingers across the windshield. We didn't turn the car around immediately, but I could tell that we all just wanted to leave. We stopped further up on a hill, took some pictures of the Milky Way and went home. Ever since we speculate what happened to the radio and windshield that night. My friends went twice more without me, recording the same including feeling, and a small push once the car was off. What do you think? I believe there are many logical explanations, but considering the fact that I'm a person who believes in this stuff and had an adrenaline rush that night, it's hard for me to grasp something rational. While hiking in Switzerland, I decided to see the Matterhorn, the famous mountain up close. So I left the village I was staying in early, Zermatt, and walked through meadows, hills, and then up the mountain to reach the plateau. Early in the morning, after just having left the town, I walked the straight path, past some houses on the left, the town behind me, the mountain ahead, and forests on the right. In front of the forests, there were few curious old huts on stilts, the ones that require you to climb by a ladder. They were all made of round planks and soot black. My imagination, immediately thought of witch huts, out of all the movies and media that I'd consumed. They seemed closed, not to mention I didn't really want to get in them. So I kept walking. I saw the mountain, met some people, had lunch in the afternoon and then decided to walk back to town. I remembered the way and backtracked pretty much exactly. On my way back, the mountain was behind me town ahead, houses and meadows on the right, and the dark spooky huts on the left, guiding the entrance, leading to the forest. I should note that despite checking out the huts in the morning, I didn't notice there was a forest path behind them. Curious about it, I checked the wooden road sign placed in the vicinity of the huts. To my surprise, the one pointing in the direction of the woods said Zermatt, but the one pointing to where I was originally coming from in the morning said the name of another town, Furry. I was very confused. I looked back and looked again, thinking that maybe my brain was playing a trick on me, but I kept seeing what I saw. I stood there while few hikers passed in each direction and they all stayed on the main path. Nobody went into the forest or looked at the road signs. I sat there in front of the huts and smoked a cigarette, and thought whether I should go into the forest, and why the signs showed such strange directions. I wondered if there was a reason I should go in, but I was already very tired to the point my legs were feeling weak. So I opted to go the way I came from, to trust my gut, and to take the most main path back to town. When I stood up, 
the signs were different. There was no way anyone could have rearranged them, no wind, no human. It was there the whole time. And the only people who walked by didn't stop at the signs, let alone to tinker with them. I told this story to my friend in Zermatt, and he just laughed at the idea of paranormal entities trying to lure me into the forest. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania near Maryland. We live in the boondocks and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring towards my neighbor's house, who lived isolated in the middle of the woods in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up for about a mile, joking all the way. Now let me give you a bit of backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk and attempted to shoot bottles off each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who died burned down the bar and the cabins. Then they were later hanged by the bar owners of the family of the people who passed. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and people who passed away here in the fires still lurk around the forests. Another incident takes place in the 80s or 90s. A team was driving really fast with his friends at the exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The team crashed into a tree, beheading his friend and leaving him alive. He was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad omens. So we were exploring the trail approaching the house. As we approached the house, we heard a very distinct whistle, but thought nothing of it as it was spring, it was warm, and there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then a whole tree. It was a dead tree that probably would have been easy to push down. We looked behind it, and saw a humanoid figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized it was a man, ripped with ragged overalls, that had no more color and a worn out, no colored, plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran to the other side where we were cut off by an electric fence. We then turned the other way. By this time we were way off trail in the middle of the woods but I knew that all I had to do was go down back on the trail. By the time we got back on the trail, we lost him. I tell you, I'm never going back there again. When I was nine, my parents bought a derelict farm deep in the woods of Sweden. This wasn't the first time my parents did that. My parents had just sold the first farm after they'd made it livable. I was sad to part with it, but looked forward to a whole new world of adventure and discoveries. Nothing spooky ever happened on the first farm. I was never scared of the old house or the woods around it. I would be alone for hours in the woods just playing and making dens for the picnics with my imaginary team of adventurers. Something changed though when we bought the next farm. The first couple of times we went to paint the building on the house, nothing happened. I was just exploring the different buildings and the woods around us. Bear in mind, this farm had four buildings. The main house, a garage, a stable, and we never found out what the fourth building was. It was badly damaged after it had burnt down. I was really into horses and used all my time up in the stables. We had owned the house for a year when something strange happened. I was in the stable playing with some hay when I suddenly felt like someone had their hands around my neck and squeezed. I couldn't breathe. I instantly ran out the stable and as soon as I saw my mum, could I breathe again? But I was coughing and wheezing and couldn't stop. 
I tried to explain what happened, but my throat hurt so much that I kept coughing. My mum rushed me inside the house and got me some water. I was still coughing and gasping after 15 minutes. So my mum decided to drive me to the hospital while my dad stayed with my brothers. I eventually stopped coughing, of course, and no one could really understand what happened. Just FYI, before the next part, up until I was 14, I had never had any allergies and had my first asthma attack when I was 13. The episode was written off as an asthma attack. Looking back now, knowing what an actual asthma attack felt like, I call bull. After the whole thing, I stopped being able to play in the stables and opted for playing in the woods with my brothers. The next time something happened was when I was 11. I'd woken up in the middle of the night to hear someone walking. I stood up from my bed and walked past my parents who were sleeping in the same room. I went to the kitchen and saw a black figure standing in the middle of it. Had I not noticed, I walked by my dad and would have thought it was him. I was frozen, but something came over me. I quickly turned around and walked straight to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I felt eyes staring at me the entire night. And the next day I told my parents that there was a man in the kitchen, but they told me that I was probably dreaming it. One occurrence though left me terrified and I begged my parents to leave me with my grandparents whenever they went to the farm. I was on my computer chatting with some online friends and playing a game. My parents wanted to go grocery shopping and asked if I wanted to come too. I declined being really into my game and they asked me if I was sure. I nodded and they left me with my brothers. I immediately regretted not going as soon as the door slammed shut. A feeling of terror overcame me. I was scanning the whole room. I was scanning the whole room and I was scared to find something that really shouldn't be there. The car had already pulled out and was on the dirt road and out of sight. The sound of the car drifted away and I was left in terror and silence. The silence somehow grew louder and louder until it was deafening and I felt a pop in my ears. I was shaking, my teeth were chattering. Then I heard a tap and another in a predictable rhythm. I knew it would be at least two hours until my family came home since the grocery store was quite far. I had to endure it, but something sent me running out of the house. In the doorway to the kitchen, I saw a figure walking towards me. This time I knew it wasn't a dream. My lungs felt like they were being crushed and I began getting a headache. I stared at the figure for a good five seconds. Then in pure shock, I sprinted out of the back door towards the dirt road. I was thankful I was still wearing my flip flops after eating breakfast outside. I ran up the dirt road aiming to get help from the neighbor who lived 20 minutes away. I didn't expect to see our car come down the road though. I walked to the side of the road and my parents hopped out and asked me what happened. I burst out crying. So they told me to get into the car because I refused to go into the house again. My parents thought I had made it up and told me I was paranoid. I stand by what I saw and years later, I still hate that farm. I visited once, but never again. Whatever was on that farm didn't like me and me specifically. I just have one thing that was bothering me a lot. How long was I frozen in place? Like I said, it takes hours for us to go grocery shopping and it felt like what happened occurred in about five to 10 minutes. To be honest, I don't even want to know. I'm just happy I never had to go back there again. I've lived in a small town in Kentucky for my entire life. And because of that, I have been surrounded by the mountains and the woods for years. My current house is literally nestled into the woods in the middle of nowhere. And thus, outdoor activities have taken up a large chunk of my time, especially in the summer and fall. I'm in the woods almost daily, hiking to the creeks to fish or meadows to hunt. And I know the woods and trails around my home like the back of my hand. That said, there is definitely something that calls you while you're in the woods. 
especially when you're alone. And I've just now realized it after stumbling upon these kind of stories. My parents began allowing me to hike alone when I was around 13. But I didn't get really into it until about two years later when I was 15. Even then, though I wasn't allowed to go very far, I always had to carry a walkie talkie with me so I could contact my family if necessary. Later at 17, I'd be allowed to carry a firearm with me. But that was neither here nor there. There's stories I can tell you at that age too. But this one takes place when I was 15. I should also mention, I have two outside dogs, Max, a black Labrador, and Bo, a beagle. I've had both since I was very young, and they're super smart, always staying by my side when I'm in the woods, and they always listen to me until this day. I was hiking a trail that runs up beyond my aunt's house, one that I'd hiked day in, day out, just out and about enjoying the woods. It was in October, so the weather was cool, not hot, and I had been hiking for around an hour. The trail comes out on a spring that runs down from the top of this particular mountain. It hadn't rained lately, so the spring was mostly dry and covered in leaves. I remember looking up the mountain, which I'd never hiked to the top of before, and feeling this strange call. It wasn't really a voice, but it was an urge I couldn't ignore. Keep in mind that I'm a very timid person and hiking unfamiliar trails on my own freaks me out to this day. But that day, all my fear had dissipated. All thought left my head. I just climbed higher and higher, my dogs following me. I don't even know how to describe the feeling that came over me. But I remember just staring down at my feet and feeling at peace as I climbed. There was a moment when I paused to look out at the houses below. I'd never been that high. Remember, and I felt amazed. I looked at a picture on my phone and then looked around for my dogs. Bo had already run off and Max was following. I called out to them frantically to stop, but they wouldn't listen. They vanished. At this point, I looked down the mountainside and was very afraid. Then I looked back uphill and it came over me again. I kept hiking. I couldn't stop. Eventually, I heard my walkie talkie crackle. Everything was distorted, and I couldn't make any of the words out. I assume now that I was just out of range for it to pick up. But back then it freaked me out. Whatever had come over me lost its hold on my mind. My dogs were still gone. Panicked, I began running downhill. It's a wonder I didn't get hurt. As I neared the wide section of the spring near the bottom, my walkie talkie picked back up and I heard my dogs running downhill behind me. I got home and mostly forgot about it. I just told myself I had almost been lost and had to be more careful. Fast forward to many years later and I still hike. At this point, Max is very old and no longer hikes with me, so it's just Bo. Last year, I hiked up to a cave behind my house, as I've done so, so many times before. And then I started following a trail I'd never fully explored, just out of curiosity. Bo was ahead of me as usual, but when I called her back, she'd come. We hiked for the better part of 45 minutes, following a pretty simple trail. And then I figured I'd better be heading back, because it'd be getting dark soon. And yet I couldn't stop. I kept telling myself I'd just go a little bit further, just to see a little bit more. And I remember looking down at my feet, just like before and listening to the silence of the woods around me, and feeling at peace. It felt so easy to just keep going deeper, and so difficult to turn around. Bo felt the call too, because even after I did break out of it and turn around, only after stumbling on a root, and then called back to her, she wouldn't stop. I had to catch up with her physically, turn her around and pet her before she'd come to me. I don't know what you will make of all of this. What if I hadn't stumbled over that route? 
Or what if my mum hadn't decided to contact me at that moment? How deep would I have hiked? And what would have waited for me in those depths? I don't know what's out there, but I know this. The woods call to us all. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, located in the Caribbean. According to our folklore, a doden is the spirit of a child who passed away before baptism. They have no faces except an O-shaped mouth, feet turned backwards and a large hat. They usually lure children into the woods to make them lost and to pass from this world like they did. They also tend to be present at rivers and bamboo patches. Growing up, my grandparents and elder relatives would always warn me about them, considering I live near a forested area and there's a river right behind my house. They'd usually say, if Duans heard someone call your name, they can take on the voice of those persons and use it to lure you in. I usually ignored their warnings and would play close to the river by myself because I was an only child back then. One evening when I was about 10, I was in my hammock in the patio. I had a clear view of the river and a bamboo patch from where I was. It was around 4pm and I realised the atmosphere suddenly turned eerie. The wind stopped blowing. The trees were still and not a sound could be heard from any animals. The street I live in became too quiet. It was almost as if it were frozen in time. While rocking in the hammock, I heard my mum suddenly call my name. It was as if she was shouting, and she kept calling me for two minutes straight until I looked back and shouted, All right, I'm coming. Now this is where it gets weird. All the time she was calling, it was coming in the direction of the bamboo patch from across the river. I was confused as to why my mum would be there, but my gut told me to check inside the house first. Walking through the house, I could still hear her calling me until I reached the back room and found my mum doing laundry. I asked her if she was calling me, and she said she'd never called me. I looked out the back door, and the calling stopped. I asked my mum if she heard someone calling my name, and she said she heard nothing. Since then, I stopped playing outside, and I never heard my name called again. The Devil's Bathtub requires multiple creek crossings. I scoped the trail on several different websites, and as a frequent rock climber, crawler, and hiker, I felt that I would be able to take the challenge. I knew that a group of two women in their early 30s, and two preteens, we would be a bit slow. Slower than that website suggested anyway. But again, I felt no insecurities. Even as we read of a rescue in the last 24 hours due to flash flooding, we felt confident they had reopened the park for the entire day without issue. There was no chance of rain, and we brought our phones in waterproof cases with full charge and backup flashlights in the event that we would need them. I felt very confident that we would be fine on well-marked trails, regardless of the time of day. I screenshotted several of the maps I found with clear markings and main notes of what to look for to ensure we were on the correct path. I even saved someone's local directions, noting landmarks like the descending rope and rusted fishing boat. Yet something I could have not have expected or prepared for happened to my best friend, her daughter, and my sister tonight. We arrived at the parking area around 7 p.m with an estimated sunset time of 8.30ish. We noted an old red Chevy truck and a pair of men's shoes. We began to walk towards the first crossover, and we saw a man pair of pants by the water. I took this as a sign that the others were on the path with us, and kept in mind there was a possibly shoeless and pantless man roaming the woods with us. The girls were scared, as the water was knee deep in one spot. And I tried to make sure I remembered the specific spot as it would be our last dream to cross it on the way out. And I didn't necessarily want me or the girls to get back into the car totally soaking wet. 
my friend Brittany and I coaxed the girls across and celebrated as we shared the feeling of accomplishment together. We moved on deeper into the forest following the yellow markers, crossing multiple streams and my sister of 11 began to move quicker and quicker ahead of us. Being diagnosed with ADHD, I thought nothing of it. She often has spurts of energy at random times, and I attributed it to excitement. Brittany's daughter, Lexi, also with 11, called my sister to slow down, asking why she was going so fast. She just seemed to move quicker, and I started to get annoyed. Lexi was far behind Kat, and I felt like she was just being rude to her friend. So I called to her to slow down. It's right here, guys. What's right here? Do you see the rope yet? It's right here, come look. Look here. Brittany looked nervous at this point. She'd already asked me about turning back several times, but had pushed through as we all watched Kat push deeper and deeper into the forest. We all struggled to keep up with her. I had borrowed shoes from my mother that were not designed for this terrain. I just couldn't catch her. This seemed to go on endlessly, at least 10 real minutes, when I finally came to a steep descent and she stopped. Brittany very politely and calmly begged the three of us start back and momentarily, I felt a tinge of worry too, but for some reason I told Kat, fine, run up to the edge of the water and see if you can see the rope. And if not, we're turning back. Kat took off the trail and quickly reached the edge of the next crossover. And as I yelled, can you see the rope? She disappeared, not necessarily in front of me, but she was standing at an edge and then she was not. Maybe I looked down at my footing, maybe I blinked, but she was gone and I told Brittany I was gonna get her. I was mortified that she kept running ahead. It wasn't something she usually did. She usually stuck alongside her friend while mildly yet consistently complaining about being tortured in nature away from her iPhone and TikTok, like every other 11 year old girl. But this was different. I called out to her and began moving faster and listening for her to jump out and yell prank like she loves to do. But I couldn't hear anything. I moved faster, not even thinking about Brittany or Lexi at this point with my mind racing. I thought about the man's pants and shoes. I looked on the sides of the trail and began to run looking for any trace of a struggle. I called her over and over, but it was like she was vanished into thin air. I pushed faster into the forest, trying to be careful, watching my footing, but I was beginning to slightly panic. She had been missing from my sight for at least eight to 10 minutes on a trail we had never visited near multiple bodies of swift swimming water. Even at 11, my sister is a tiny petite kid with 1% body fat. And I ran. From nowhere, I heard her little voice. It's here. Come see, it's right here. The knot in my stomach disappeared having heard her voice, yet returned immediately after processing the words. It's right here. What's right here? My heart and my foot sunk as I looked down for a split second to find my shoe stuck in muddy sand. I looked up and called to Kat and found her directly in front of me. She pointed to the river again saying, it's right here, can't you see it? I snapped out of it and told her we were turning back and we had to find Brittany and Lexi. She went further towards the stream and said, I didn't come here for nothing. I was a little struck by her enthusiasm and tone. Although she appeared to be in a trance by the water, I convinced her to turn her body from the edge and at that moment, Brittany and Lexi appeared from the thick of the forest. There are other people behind us. I feel fine, let's go. Brittany yelled as we embarked on another crossing. Cat ran ahead, seemingly fearless, and once again out of my sight. I ran angrily yelling about taking her phone when we get back to the car, but she pushed on. This threat is usually enough to send her into World War III with me over her phone, but she persisted. We saw another old couple on their way back as I watched Kat cross another stream and ask how much longer, feeling reassured by their age. Just two more crossings and you're nearly there. 
We pushed even harder and deeper, trying to keep up with Kat as she fell in and out of view. We finally arrived at the devil's bathtub and took a dip in the water as the younger couple who had been behind us dove in from the rocks above us for a few moments. We enjoyed the beautiful blue water and then both Brittany and I felt an overwhelming feeling to get back to the car before it became too dark. It was 8.50 after all. We started back with the younger couple on our trail. We hiked by daylight for some time before finally turning on our flashlights. The younger couple passed by us at some point. Kat still pushed forward, but not nearly as quickly or as far ahead as before. The couple began to wait for us at each stream crossing with their flashlights, shining as a beacon for the girls to follow. I appreciated it because it was getting dark fast. We tried to stay closer to them, the darker it got, and found them climbing up into the forest via a small bubbling brook that was straight and a direct ascension up to a yellow marker. I shined my light towards the brook, trying to show the couple and the girls that the marker was actually just a down tree that had fallen the way of the brook. I pointed to the yellow marker yet again across the stream and we embarked together. My sister was the third to cross after the couple and myself. And once I was just a bit out of reach, she screamed and I watched her slip on a rock and lose her shoe. She cried emotionally and was shaken and everyone felt disoriented as we crossed the stream again and couldn't find the path. The couple pushed on as I looked back to help the girls cross. This stream was just deep enough to slow us significantly down in comparison to the younger couple, and I watched their flashlights fade into the distance. This is where things got weird. There was a fallen tree on the path that I had specifically remembered from our hike in and the couple chose to walk along the side of the stream as they had originally, while I elected to meet back up with the trail about two feet above, because the girls were already cold and missing a shoe. I didn't want to push it through the cold water more than I had to. One minute the couple were there along the stream bed with their flashlights fading, and I saw where they went and pushed forwards, but there was nothing there now. No trail, no path, Every hint of a trail led to a dead end. I crossed back over to where I left the girls, to where I last saw their light, thinking I had mistaken the marker, thinking I had gotten turned around. I'm 30 by the way, and my only talent is visual memory. I've hiked through riverbeds my entire life, and I've never once gotten turned around. My family and friends trust and know me to be the visual mapper of any hike, bike or walk. Needless to say, I was beginning to get worried for a second time. We crossed back again, spying the rusted boat that served as a landmark to the halfway point. My sister and I argued which side it had been on. Brittany and Lexi seemed to have not noticed it at all originally, but I pulled up the notes I had taken and showed them its exact location on the trail. Kat and I led the group past the boat along the trail before Lexi announced she knew about the boat's location on the trail, and we were heading back to the devil's bathtub. The girls began to cry as we stood looking at my phone, trying to decipher where the trail led. I employed some of my teacher tactics and tried to encourage the girls how this would be a great story and was a great adventure to experience with our closest friends. Lexi began screaming, asking if anyone was out there and as badly as I didn't want to admit defeat, I didn't want to lose the moment where I could possibly be heard by the young couple. I whistled as loudly as I could and within seconds I saw flashlights from the couple reappear on the west side we had just crossed 15 minutes ago. We rejoined them and they told us they had turned back because they lost sight of our flashlights. We'd been in the same spot for roughly half hour at this point but the couple acted as if they left us moments ago. The woman said, follow us, we know a quicker way. And we blindly took off following them. We crossed the last stream to be greeted by some 50 to 100 white moths fluttering directly around only my sister. We got back into the water to wash them off and I noticed the pants were still folded neatly by the stream. 
We ran from the bank of the last crossing and were sprinting to the car and whipped it out of those woods as quickly as we could. We saw the younger couple getting back into the truck that had been there before we arrived. The shoes were gone. We were gone. And grateful, it was now 10.30. Brittany handed me her phone once we reached service and introduced me to Missing 411. I read many of the posts because I found an odd number of similarities between some of the stuff which happened here and what's happened to others. At 4am, my sister awoke with a nosebleed. Tonight's events could be explained logically and simply. Don't underestimate mother nature and come prepared and be aware of your surroundings and don't go hiking in sandals at dusk with younger peeps. But my resounding question is what the hell happened to my sister that night? Was something trying to keep her there? Was something trying to keep us there? It felt like an outside entity was oppressively trying to keep us from making good decisions that we would have made under normal circumstances. But I don't know. In July 2015, my family and I took our motorhome out to the Oregon, California coast. We go here as much as we can, and we hike the Redwood Forest trails to Crescent City, California, at least once in the week. My friend went along with us this trip. She and I decided to leave my husband and my in-laws to a quiet afternoon and take my rambunctious boys on a hiking trail. We were going to go on one we always did, but there are so many people all around us, so we chose to take a new one. As we were hiking, my kids were going up and back a bit, and I was scolding them for getting too far ahead of me, and that they could fall and I needed to be close. They would back up a bit and then do it again, much like any child. We'd gone about a mile, passing people along the way when we came to a bridge. There was a guy who was stopped at the end of it, and I don't know what exactly gave me this weird feeling at first, but I collected my boys close to me as we came nearer. He was just staring at us without blinking. My friend came up behind us and happened to snap a faraway picture of the encounter. As we reached the end of the bridge, I had all my kids with me, and he was just staring. Then he looked at me and said in the eye, You want to know a fun game to play here? I didn't fully respond, but he answered anyway. Hide and seek. At that point, my friend caught up with us and heard it too. We both were very creeped out, and when we got out of earshot, talked about how something was seriously off with that guy. But we did not want to double back and happened to meet him on our own without weapons and with three young boys. So we both picked up some sticks and decided to walk a bit further in the hopes that we would come along another group of people. My heart was racing. There isn't great cell service in all areas of the trail, though it is far from remote. When we happened along more people, we turned around and headed back with them. About a half mile up, we saw the same guy walking back the other way. We hauled out of there, staying with as many people as possible at one time. There was a man on the cell phone talking about something on the trail. My assumption was he was reporting to this man, but then I was already creeped out and was not checking to ask. Ever since this, I googled for unsolved murders in the area. I couldn't help it. We both just had that feeling. After he spoke, I wasn't sure if he wanted to hurt us or something like that. Maybe I'm paranoid, but I believe in following the spidey senses. The following events happened in the woods of northern Sweden. I spent a couple of summers at my grandparents' house located in the woods. A lot of strange things happened but this is by far one of the strangest experiences. When I was 10, I spent the summers at my grandparents, who, as I said, live in the northern parts of Sweden. They had a cabin out in the woods next to a beautiful lake, a long way away from the nearest town. We had electricity, but no running water, 
so it was very rural. Just behind the cabin there was dark and thick woods with an eerie feeling that was present each time you ventured into them. Each year I went to my grandparents and I did so together with my cousin. We lived in a small cabin separate from where my grandpa and grandpa lived. So when we wanted to go to the cabin, we would have to walk about 30 meters. Our cabin being separate from theirs becomes important later in the story. One summer my grandpa took us on a long walk out into the woods. Now my grandpa was always special. And during this walk he told us stories about strange things happening in the woods, like stories involving trolls and other mysterious beings. On this special occasion, he told us about something which roughly translates from Swedish to little people, small human like creatures invisible to the naked eye who live out in these woods. As we went deeper along into the woods, he told us that these little people sometimes crossed the roads where people walked. And when this happened, people wandering those roads would just freeze in place for no apparent reason until the little people had passed the road. My cousin being a kid proceeded to joke by suddenly stopping and proclaiming that he had come upon one of the little people trails and froze in place. I laughed, but strangely enough, my grandpa wasn't amused. He was adamant that you shouldn't joke about the little people while in the woods. We thought nothing more of it and eventually went back to the cabin. Nothing happened for the rest of the day. And later in that evening, me and my cousin went to our cabin to go to sleep. We got around three hours of sleep until we were suddenly awoken at 3am by a commotion going on around the cabin. The outside of the cabin's walls sounded like they were being scratched by a large bear. Small pebbles were raining down on the roof. And we heard scratching coming from under the beds. In short, it was very loud and absolutely terrifying. It was like being completely surrounded by noise and chaos. We panicked, ran from our cabin, woke our grandparents and spent the night in theirs. The next day, my grandpa brought us into the woods where we threw candy into the trees and said we were sorry. Nothing more happened after that. And we never made fun of the local legends again. To this day, it's by far the most extreme experience I've ever had. The noise and how it seemed to come from every direction was insane. I've spent quite a lot of time outdoors in the last two years. In 2016, I threw hiked the AT in 205 days, 2189 miles up in the East Coast. This year, I rode my bike up the 800 mile Arizona Trail, then rode Santa Barbara to Vancouver, British Columbia, along the Pacific Ocean. Now I'm 1100 miles into a southbound continental divide trail hike that went through Montana and Wyoming, and will enter Colorado soon. I've always been fascinated with the paranormal and started listening to Coast to Coast AM at 17 or 18. No story on there has hooked me more than the likes of George Knapp's interview with David Politis. The phenomenon is still so bizarre and intriguing. So I'll just tell the stories that come to mind in no particular order. I'm just gonna say it, but places totally have vibes to them. Some places that we walk through are straight up hair raising, and I can never figure out why yet I've confirmed it with other hikers. I'll usually ask, Hey, did you feel weird back there? And they'll always go, Yeah, I did. Just didn't feel right. One place in Utah comes to mind. It was a short day hike I did with my girlfriend in Canyonlands. Forget the name, but look up the trail on the side of an old crater. I think they theorize it was a meteor strike ages ago, but I don't really know. Anyway, we got to a spot sat down and were suddenly overcome with an incredible sense of lethargy, to the point where we both wanted to fall asleep on that rock. I'm a pretty disciplined hiker. So I stood up and said that we couldn't deadly. Oddly, I also had this gut feeling that we shouldn't fall asleep. And also weirdly, my girlfriend said offhandedly in a joking manner, that some other day hikers are coming up the trail, and to be careful up there. There's a vortex that will suck you in and put you to sleep. She meant vortex in the hiker context, 
of a town that'll suck you in and keep you doing unplanned zeros. But still, odd choice of language, right? And I'm reminded of cases of UFOs and fey abductions that start with people inexplicably falling asleep in the woods in the middle of the day. Speaking of weird places, the AT Trail crosses through an area known as the Bennington Triangle. Going south, you cross over Glastonbury Mountain and then enter the town of Bellington. Apparently, there were four or five missing 411 style disappearances there in the 1940s, and the natives avoided the area because they believed devils lived on the mountain. When I walked through the day before, I had written a blog post about how the trail was teaching me to follow my gut, and how following my gut always seemed to save me from storms and other things that just generally turn out good. Well, this day I was planning to go through a small town called Manchester Centre, then climb up onto Glastonbury Mountain, then camp on the mountain. In Manchester Centre, I eat a burrito and have the worst stomach cramps I've ever seen. I tried using the bathroom to wait it out, and nothing, so I booked a room at a motel. Literally the second I paid and get to the room, my stomach pain goes away. This was cramped so bad, I was hunched walking over, and then they just disappeared in a matter of seconds. But I'd already paid, so I stayed. I didn't have the runs or anything like that, and everything was 100% normal after I changed my plans. I climbed the mountain and went to Bellington the next day, only after I realized that I would have been on the mountain in the night of a full moon. Is that relevant? No idea. But it just struck me as very odd how I wrote about following my gut, and then my gut literally forced me not to climb the mountain. Oh, on the way down is where the long trail at the AT intersect, and that intersection is where a young woman disappeared in the 40s without a trace. Weird. Now that I'm thinking of weird places with bad vibes, it reminds me of this small five mile loop I do at home in Missouri. When I walk this, I usually always stopped about three miles in and turned around. No real reason, that's just what I always did. I went in there maybe four years ago with an ex-girlfriend. We ate about 1.5 grams of shrooms each, and the first hour of the trip were great, hanging out about a mile into the loop. Then we decided to hike more and entered the section that I unintentionally avoided. It was strange. The only way I can describe it is that it felt like evil descended on us. I'm getting goosebumps just remembering, and I felt like this deep pit of despair and depression came from me out of nowhere, and I just knew that year was when I was going to pass. I knew that our relationship was over, and we both got real quiet and didn't talk for about half an hour. Then I came to the ledge and kept getting these horrible images of her running at full speed and charging off this ledge. Then all of a sudden, the oppressive energy lifted, and we both burst out at the same time. Did you feel that? So she also felt that incredible negative energy, and felt that we were done. Our reactions were very interesting. We both felt like we should focus more on spirituality, and develop a stronger spiritual base. I kept having the thought that, the greatest lie is that there is no good or evil in this world. If you believe that you're truly vulnerable to evil. So after this experience, we got into hypnosis a little. She could fall into trance very easily. One session, I took her back to the day she absolutely freaked, and she said that we were attacked by a demon who attacked those who are undecided. Now I'm not religious at all, and still I'm not, and I think this is her Catholic upbringing coloring her experience, but I do think there was something very evil that day in the woods. Even with these experiences and all the content I listen to regarding the paranormal and missing 411, I don't feel at all threatened or in danger in the woods. I'd say 99% of the time out there, I feel as comfortable as if I were sitting on my couch at home. We were built to be in nature, and the woods, and the wild, they're really not threatening places. Spend enough time out there and you'll feel right at home. I think this phenomenon, whatever it was, had an element of choice and free will. I've always maintained that I absolutely do not want any truly weird encounters anywhere, and I tend to think that this mindset matters. 
However, like mediums say, they can repress and shut down their abilities. Which reminds me, I met a hiker in Montana that hiked with us a bit. She said she used to do a lot of spiritual type work. And when she was really sensitive, she could literally sense all sorts of stuff and see entities and spirits in the woods. But it freaked her out. So she had to shut that down. Not sure what to think about that. But interesting nonetheless. Perhaps this is why children seem to disappear more. It could be much easier to coerce and trigger a child than an adult. It seems folklore always talks about permission. Like how vampires can't enter your domain without it. How fairies try to trick you into eating and drinking their food. And if you do, you're stuck in their realm. How entities will try and lure you off the path. It seems the common thread in that element of free will on your part. Like you have to willingly participate or give to permission to be tricked. That's something that's given me a lot of peace because I do feel very attuned to my intuition. And the longer I hike, the more intuitive I become. I think this sixth sense really does help keep me safe out there. And perhaps our modern people are at great risk in the wild now because we have let this natural sixth sense deteriorate. I also feel intuitively that much of this weirdness has a spiritual element. How or why I can't articulate well, but from everything I've experienced and all the info I've read, I tend to think that it's not simply a flesh or blood material phenomena, but more deeply tied into our spirit and the spiritual plane, whatever that may be. I'm a teen that has a strange hobby. I raise, breed and sell rabbits. A layout of what I call the bunny barn. You walk in and all four walls have cages lining them. Two walls have windows looking out onto the fields, which we grow a tall grass that's normally around eight foot in height. Anyway, we live on the edge of a forest and sometimes we'll see deer and elk, maybe a coyote or wolf, but most of the time they stick to their forest. But while I was unloading the truck of rabbit feed, I noticed that some of the bags when I came back had little puncture marks on them. I tried to rationalize this as maybe mice chewing holes in the bag, but something felt off. I then continued to have strange encounters with a dark figure that I will see watching me, but not harm me. Although I've never felt scared or that I'm in danger. But when I started losing 10 bags of rabbit food weighing 50 pounds each, they all disappeared after I'd made sure they were locked away and secure so that mice and wild animals wouldn't be able to get to them. Then I lost around $200 a week due to what I'm guessing has to be the figure. But recently the figure has been appearing closer to around my house more often. One time, even the bunny barn. I've started to get nervous and scared when I see it. It's everywhere now, and I can't escape it. I thought maybe when deer season comes around, I can leave this area and do some hunting alone. I was sitting in my stand alone four hours away from the house. I then heard some footsteps and drew back my bow in case it's a buck about to step forward and give me a clean shot. But it was the black figure. I expected him to stop, but he got closer and closer. He was at the base of my tree. He grabbed the ladder and began to climb. I started screaming and yelling for him to stop, eventually knocking an arrow and shooting it at him. It went straight through him and he didn't stop. I accepted fate. But once he got to me, I closed my eyes and prayed. But he dropped my arrow that I had clearly seen pass through him and hit the ground with a solid thud. He never went back down to grab it. It's been a while since I've seen him. I stopped losing rabbit food, but I recently had a large setback that I believed to be him. There was no way that I lost 20 of my 24 rabbits all in one night, all perished without a single mark on them. I must have been around eight or nine when this happened. I grew up in a small rural community in the south. I would spend the long summers at my grandparents house making forts out of abandoned chicken coops and playing in what felt like an endless forest. A lot of strange things had happened during those summers. 
this is just one of those occurrences. I had went out on my own into the woods that afternoon. I just had to be back before it got dark. I had run a different way this time. I got lost. I remember it not being scary, just unfortunate. I had come up upon what looked like a dried up riverbed. I followed it for a while. I'd never seen it before. It was deep, at least up to my head. It just went on and on. I thought maybe it'd lead me back to somewhere I recognized, but it didn't. Instead, the ground thundered. It felt like a thousand horses were charging. There were so many drums beating in an unnatural tempo. I heard shouting that I couldn't understand. It wasn't any language I'd heard before. Screeching. It was terrifying. I didn't know where it was coming from or why it was happening. I curled up in the ravine I was hiding in, but didn't know from what. The excitement had passed, and I got the nerve to climb out, but there was nothing. It was silent. All of the sounds one would expect to hear in the woods had just evaporated. This was almost as chilling as the horses. I felt like something was chasing me, that I didn't belong there. I just ran and ran in a direction, and I came out at a small barn behind my grandma's home. I was screaming when I found her. She didn't seem surprised and didn't discredit my experience. It's like she knew. I'd never pressed her further for on it in later life, although I wish I had. I tried to find that riverbed a few years later to no avail. To this day, I still have no explanation for what happened in those woods then. I do know whatever did occur, it was not natural. This happened to me in early December of 2015, in the morning between 9 and 10. That morning, I decided to go on a hike. It's pretty mild outside for Quebec at that time of year. There was no snow on the ground, and it was not frozen yet. I got to the woods, parked my car, and started walking. Nothing was unusual. But the woods were pretty silent due to the time of year. After maybe 20 minutes, I arrived at a bridge. As I was crossing, I slipped and fell. I guess there was some freezing rain during the night, and not fully melted to make the bridge slippery. Only thing I got from that fall were bruises. I got up and kept walking, and out of nowhere a deer came out the woods and crossed the trail running at full speeds. I kept walking because it was just a deer and nothing to worry about, but something seemed off. There was literally no noise, and I felt as if I were being watched. I kept walking for a few more minutes before I got creeped out and decided to turn around. I was not panicking yet, but my heart was racing. I crossed on the other side of the bridge and from the woods came this noise. It was loud and very low pitch and lasted between three to five seconds. It sounded like a growling. I could not recognize the sound, but I knew it was abnormal. At that point, I got scared and suddenly felt my blood chill. I remember thinking, what the hell was that? And could not see anything moving but could hear some cracking in the distance. The only thing I had with me was a short-handled axe. I made an improvised wooden pike to make me feel better, and which probably looked silly, and waited to see if the noise, or what made it, would show its face. But it didn't. I was still feeling watched. But I said to myself, screw it, and kept walking to the end of the woods. When I got back to my parents' house, I told them what happened, and they didn't believe me. My father said it was probably a bear, but I had my doubts. I already had a bear growl at me, and it didn't sound like that. This happened a long time ago. I was 12, and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually about one, took all the cattle to graze, and at night, he would take them back. Cows know where to go when going home. My grandpa had a male ox since my father was an adult, and he wasn't there. I took the responsibility. 
Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after me, calling the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to do a clearing up the mountain, and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm and Abu was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him and have thin ropes on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, I would call them and on rare occasions poke them with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said, if I see a very old boar or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Animals dare not go near an ox herd. There's a dark part of the forest where it's very quiet and even the bravest hunters will not venture. It's very slippery and dangerous. They say that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there and honestly never wanted to go. It was an early morning and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox going up the mountain and I was glad he let me on him because it was a hard trek up. I saw one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dog to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got on tying the rope to her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned. A very old man was walking towards us. He looked frail with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox clinging to her, not wanting to fall if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls, they don't jump up and kick when scared. They either attack with their horns or trample or run. I was ready to hold on no matter what she chose. Our oxen don't take kindly to strangers before I took them out, and I had to go to every house to have the ox owner introduce me to their animal. That way they saw that their owners trusted me with their herd leader, our ox. I knew she would either attack or bolt, but she just stood there. The stranger came up to us, petted her on the head, whispered something I didn't understand, and he looked at me. His eyes were completely white, and then he turned and vanished into the trees. Suddenly the female grunted, as if she'd just woken up, and bolted the way we came. We found the herd and I quickly got on our rocks and yelled, water. He knew that command and went down towards the river, where the houses were, as it was closer to home. I barged into one of the houses to try to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days remembering those white eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house or garden and I wasn't allowed near the trees. Later I learned they were protecting me from a lensic, a forest spirit which can take the form of a man, owl or wolf. It hates when people go into its part of the woods and can take you. I later learned that the ox that took me there had fallen ill and passed away. It sometimes stayed in the trees as an owl watching for the offender. For years when I went with my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside, but inside too. I'm never going into those woods again. I was foraging in the woods for raspberry leaves for a tea. I was foraging on private property with permission, and the owner, an old lady, was not there. I was in the middle of the woods, and I came out into a clearing and was doing my thing when I looked up. A bald figure in a seemingly fresh, washed, white sweatshirt was staring at me. The moment my head moved up, they began to run clumsily back into the woods. I didn't get a good look at them, and I'm not sure if what I saw was correct. It was a blur because I immediately looked away. All I knew was that it looked bold and their sweatshirt was stunningly white. I looked down for a fraction of a second, stupefied and scared, freaking out a little bit. I looked up again to make sure they weren't going to try and attack me. Having been a minor, that was a concern of mine. But when I looked up, they were gone. I slowly walked to where the man had stood. Hey, what are you doing? For a nearly second, I stood there. But then... I began to book it in the opposite direction. My sense had finally come to me. I've no freaking idea what happened, 
and I definitely will not go to that specific clearing again. When I was about 16 or 17, I had a friend whose parents owned property deep in the forest of the Ozarks in Missouri. He had depression and all kinds of other mental issues, and he wanted to get away. I asked if I could go to keep an eye on him. His mum drove us up there and I didn't know there was so much forest in southern Missouri. It went on for miles. When we got there, his mum left us with a few essentials. And during these two weeks, we didn't have power. The generator was shot, and we were running out of food, so we were on survival mode. And there were no houses for a very long way away. My friend started going crazy. He would go out and wrestle farm animals, pull out his father's weapon, and threaten to end his life, or just disappear for a days at a time, leaving me by myself in this dark forest. When he left, it wasn't so bad. It was peaceful most of the time. One of those times I was laying on the couch, and I heard some kind of musical chanting in a high voice. So I looked out the window and there was nothing there. I walked out on the front porch, and out into the forest. I didn't see anything. I thought about taking a walk down to the trail of the lake. The lake was very old and very deep, and as clear as a bell. I got to the head of the trail and something inside me told me to stay the hell away from the forest. I still hadn't seen my friend. I went back inside and ate a sandwich and fell asleep on the couch. When I woke up, it was still daylight outside. I sat up and looked out the window and there was a man standing in the clearing in front of the trailer. He was native and was of Native American descent. He walked around the clearing once, stopped in front of the trailer and stared at it for about 30 seconds. Then he retreated back into the forest down the trail. When my friend came back, I told him to call his mum. I wanted to get home. She came three days later and picked me up. I told her what happened, and she didn't seem surprised.